Cool. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. And um, also, this particular space is getting, uh, when I was working through it, it's much larger than it was even a year ago. And there's no way that I can cover everything in the time allotted. Um, so I want this to be more like a, a journey to try to give you some understanding as to what's there, what some of the trends are. And I apologize in advance for all of the things that I left out because there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. So uh, another part of this as well is that I have a lot of involvement in many of these particular projects as well. So I want to make sure that like, that's clear that it's, that it's up front as well. Um, and that's part of the reason why I can speak to, to many of these things. Um, and, uh, but if you, if you look in, in, in some of the things I'm involved with, like you'll see like I, I have connections and have operated and worked with some of these groups. Um, let's see. So, but the very first thing is, when we talk about software supply chain security, we have to ask, what exactly are we defending against? And to answer that, it's like we're trying to defend the software supply chain. What is a software supply chain? And in order to defend something, uh, in order to even generate your threat model, you have to understand what it is. And I, I try to come up with a decent definition. So there's not an official, definition that exists out there, but there's some that have good uh, approximations of, of what it is, but there's still gaps in some of the definitions. Um, so, but generally, you see something will create, they'll, they'll perform some creation of, a, of, a, of an artifact or of a thing, they will transform one thing to another, or they will assess the quality of that thing and report on it, of course, create an attestation of the, of the quality. Uh, and there's various actions that we perform that fit into those three, uh, one or all. Uh, so it's not like you, need, you can't just pigeonhole in one at a time. Uh, but things like you write code, you compile, you run an integration test, you do a code review. So these are all like actions that you can, that you can perform. Um, and so why do we want to protect the software supply chain though? There's Two things that people, that we need to look at. Now, most people, when we say, how do, what, what do we want to defend? Most people, the image that comes to mind is, how do we defend from, a, from an attacker getting into the system? And that's a very important aspect of it, but that's not the whole story. And um, a very short story, and I know that this particular one, you hear it all the time. Every time you go to a, to a security talk, you, go, you hear about log for shell. Um, but there's one particular aspect that many people uh, don't quite tend to think about. And the question is, why was log for shell so expensive? And think about this for a moment, because it wasn't just like, hey, this is bad, it's everywhere. Why was it so expensive to, to fix? There was no malicious supply chain attack that had occurred as far as we know. Like, it was a, it was a mistake. And my thinking of this, it came down to this, to this very simple idea. The cost is because we do not know where the things are. We don't know where things go. We don't have a way to map, even in many organizations, we don't have an easy way to map uh, where, when something comes in and what is the full outlay of where it is. Um, and so what happened with log for shell is when it, when it landed, we as a community had to go to every single project within our, with, within our uh, not only in the developer side, um, but also from the operation side and say, hey, are you using Java? Are you, and don't take it for granted, maybe they're not, like even projects you don't think use Java, there might be a Java component in there somewhere, so you have to ask the question. Don't, don't have implicit trust, like we, had, we covered that last time. Um, instead, what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna ask the question and, and get to that place of knowing, but it was a very manual process. And this also creates a lot of stress because we're trying to rush, we're trying to beat the exploits before they arrive. Or are they already in the gates? We don't know. So when you have that stress, you also increase the mistakes that people make as well. So, so that's, when you think of like protecting the software supply chain, there's two things. Keep the attackers out, but also know, like developers are all gonna make mistakes. We're gonna continue to make mistakes. And uh, how do we know when one of those occur? How do we know where it, where it went? So let's back up a little bit. We want to cover like what really matters, and I mentioned the stress before with people. The people are the things that matter the most. But when you talk to a CISO, you'll see people process technology. Like you'll hear this from CISOs all the time. People process technology. People matter the most. That's why it's bold and larger in this slide. You have the process, and you have at the end of the day the technology that drives it. Um, and you want to focus on the people first. 
Um, hold on a second, what happened with this SBOM thing? We, we keep talking about SBOM, we hear this, this gets injected into every conversation. So let's get, out, let's get this one out of the way first. Um, we, there's no tool that is, that is evaluated in isolation. It's important, and I'm, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a jarring side, but I want to make sure that this part is, is done first. So no tool is evaluated in isolation. So when we talk about SBOMs, we, many people will say, oh, it's, it has all of these gaps. Don't look at it as just the SBOM, look at it as the SBOM in connection with everything else that is going on and how does it, in the context of where it's going to live, how does it actually work? How does it actually fix things or help us discover where things are? A really simple example for this, uh, to use an analogy, is we do not eliminate unit tests when they don't find all the software bugs. We leave them there, we keep running them all the time. So uh, please, with SBOMs, acknowledge they, they do have a lot of limitations to them. Um, there's only room for one unicorn in your life, it's not the SBOM. Um, so let's go back to, and, and just a real quick example of an SBOM. I want people to see what you tend to see in, in, the, in them. This is SPDX. There's other fantastic formats out there as well, like Cyclone-DX and so on. Um, this, this slide will be available. I actually pulled this from uh, the SPDX repo, and uh, it's under a Creative Commons license, and so uh, you can go get the slides and then look at them earlier, or there's plenty of examples out there. But anyways, wait, we said people first, so like, right, we covered that sponsor. Okay, let's get back to people. So um, the people are the most important part. When you're working with an organization, the, the very, like we, we spoke about community before that we have here, but when you're looking at a company and how you're trying to get a company to move, the very first thing that you want to try to do is you want to try to get what they call executive alignment. You want the executives to buy into the idea that this, we're gonna take some action in unison and get them to be supportive of spending the resources to do there. Um, part of that process are things like well-written uh, policies. Like policies are things that bind our actions as people together. Um, another important thing as well is you have to, again, focus on people first. That means you have to have good training. Don't assume people will learn on their own, not because they're, they're lazy or anything similar, but don't assume they will learn on their own because they simply don't have the time. The incentive structures are not there. So provide the incentive structure, positive incentive structure, uh, so that they can, they can have the time to train, that they can have the time to keep up. This is a growing and evolving field. We cannot expect people to just know this material. Um, and then we have process. Now, as the threats change, so, so should your processes. And so a process is um, uh, the various things you do in order to meet your goal. So if your policy defines your goal, what is it you're trying to do, and your process is your roadmap on how you get there. Uh, there's some really amazing documents that I highly recommend you go take a look at. Uh, the, the one that, is, that most people will point you towards is the secure software development framework that is published by NIST, which describes what things you should put inside of an SDLC. Um, there is definitely some discussion as to like, is, does it go far enough, is it, is, is it covering the right things? Um, but before you even ask those questions though, you should just go read the document, make a, make a decision and understand like, what, they, what they're trying to, to, to talk about. Then you can ask the question, how does this actually relate to my to my development, how does it relate to my, to my environment? Um, and so there's also some additional resources um, that you can also tie into. So you have uh, Salsa uh, version one, which was recently published. Um, we here in the CNCF produce the software supply chain security best practices. It's a fantastic uh, white paper, highly recommend you, you read it if you're interested. There's also some things like the secure supply chain consumption framework. So it's not enough to just produce things in a safe and secure way. You have to work out how do you consume them. Uh, there's another one as well that uh, uh, me and Santiago, uh, who are, uh, who's also part of the CNCF or works with us in the CNCF, uh, we also helped co-author this uh, NIST SP 800-204D. I'll go more into that later as well. Uh, but these are things that can help you with that, with that process. Uh, so we have several CNCF projects that are designed specifically to help. Uh, the one that I am most involved in, uh, in the software supply chain side is, the in, is in Toto. Uh, so in Toto, we mentioned SBOMs before. SBOMs are like, what are the ingredients that, you tie, that you're gonna use to produce your software? In Toto is designed specifically to answer the question of how. Like, I did it, we went through this, like these particular systems were used to commit these code, or these people were involved with committing these code. Uh, not necessarily the legal names, it could be a well-known name as well, so I want to make sure that that's clear. 
Um, and then how does it progress through? Were code reviews done? Did, did it go into a build system that we, that we have some, uh, that, that we control? Um, what, were the, what were the various things that have gone through? Uh, in, like, did you do the integration test? Were there scans performed? So like that entire process of, of what we described in the previous one in SSDF and similar, uh, we want to be able to say, hey, we can attest the whole thing and reason about it in a programmatic way. Uh, to help with that as well, uh, two projects I've been involved with, Witness and Archivista, were added as in total subprojects as of last Tuesday. I got the text message that they were accepted. So uh, I would love to get people to, to help contribute in this particular area and to help make this something that can, that can help with that. Um, another one that we have is Tough, which is a specification for securing software updates. So once you produce that artifact, you have to be able to deliver it safely to, to your destination. Tough helps in that delivery by ensuring the integrity and, and authenticity of the updates. And so it does things like ensuring it was not tampered with and also making sure that they've not, that nobody sent an older version that is properly signed so they can't roll you back into a, into a, a broken version. There is also projects like Notary, which are a standard for and set of projects for signing and verifying workflows for OCI artifacts or container images. Uh, it's actually much larger than this in total things that they do, but there's, some, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on in Notary. It's another fantastic place that you can go and, and take a look at and make some, some good contributions. There are also other groups that we work with. We have OpenSSF. OpenSSF ha is a, has a much wider scope than just software supply chain security. They're looking at vulnerabilities in general. They have a few projects, they have several projects that, are real, that, are, that we work with. So for example, we assign things with Intoto or uh, then that thing can end, those signatures can end up in SigStore. Uh, there's the OpenSSF scorecard. If you are unfamiliar with the OpenSSF scorecard, highly recommend you go take a look at that because that is something that can help you work out uh, your vulnerabilities in general or what your, what, it helps reduce your total risk as, uh, of, your, of your project. Um, and all of this comes down to community. We also have a community impact as well. So the community here, it, it, we're, we're driving a whole bunch of things that, is, are, that are impacting other groups. So again, uh, this community and all the things that we've learned here, um, Santiago and I uh, worked towards uh, taking some of those learnings and helping frame them within the context of the SSDF in, in a way that uh, makes sense for cloud native and microservice systems. There's also groups like the CTA, ANSI, CTA, uh, mitigating cybersecurity threats and machine learning based systems. So these exact same things that we're doing here, if you think about machine learning environments, you have to know where did the data come from, what were the parameters, where did they come from, who defined them, where did the hyperparameters come from? So like model weights and similar things and, and uh, making sure that the information, if you want to do some additional vetting, where was the vetting done on, those, on that input? Before you, act, before you actually consume it as part of your ML. So it looks a lot like CI, CD systems we have. The end goal is, is perhaps different, but those processes have a lot of similarity. Um, we've also have had some impact with the IE, well, I got this, it's not IETF, it's uh, IEEE Free Future Networks. I apologize for the, for the uh, mess up on that. Uh, but we've had communications with them. Uh, the Omnibor community, uh, there's a DHS software supply chain vulnerability tools cohort that is looking to contribute into OpenSSF. Uh, that, so there's a lot of things that are going on, and this is just like a small sliver of things that we've had an impact on as a, as a community, and our impact in this space is going to just continue to grow, especially when you consider that, that we are the producers of the packaging and of, the, and of several of the runtimes. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all and please come join us in Tag Security. Tag Security is a fantastic place. There's the Software Supply Chain Working Group. There's also several other groups that you can join as well. Uh, you have the SIG Security, and you can help in Kubernetes itself. I uh, also want to point out the graphics were made with AI, I, in case anyone was wondering. And finally, I also wanted to say, like, to say that all this is like in loving memory of, uh, of our dear friend Nova as well, so I had, was keeping her in mind and wish she could be here to, uh, to help with stuff as well. But with that, I wanna thank you all for your time. Please come talk to me. Uh, please find people in this community, talk to them as well, not just me, there's a lot of us here. So again, thank you everyone.